remember that this great change in heat conductivity occurs at a single a fixed transition temperature the land the point we do indeed deal with a change in phase only here it is a change from one liquid to another liquid as we've told you before the specific heat of liquid helium is very large at the lambda point in fact it behaves abnormally even below the lambda point and falls again very rapidly with the temperature this discontinuity in specific heat is another reflection of the fact that we are dealing with a change in the phase of the substance by the way the curve resembles the greek letter lambda the transition temperature got its name from the shape of this curve we are in for more surprises the next one has to do with the viscosity of liquid helium when a normal liquid flows through a tube it will resist the flow in this experiment we shall cause some glycerin to flow through a tube under its own weight the top layer is colored glycerin the liquid layer closest to the tube wall adheres to it the layer next in from the one touching the wall flows by it and is retarded as it flows due to the interatomic the van der Waals force of attraction the second layer in turn drags on the third and so on inward from the wall producing fluid friction or viscosity the narrower the tube the slower the liquid's rate of flow through it under a given head of pressure here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultrafine porosity many capillary channels run through this ceramic disk their diameter is quite small about one micron which is one ten thousandth of a centimeter there is liquid helium in the beaker it is at 4.2 degrees Kelvin helium one the normal phase the capillaries in the disk are fine enough to prevent the liquid now in the beaker from flowing through under its own weight clearly helium one is viscous to be sure its viscosity is very small that's why we had to choose extremely fine capillaries to demonstrate it here you see the lambda point transition the helium 2 all pours out the rate of pouring would not be noticeably slower if the porosity were made yet finer we call this kind of flow a superflow the temperature is now at 1.6 degrees the superflow is even faster the viscosity of helium 2 in this experiment is so small that it has not been possible to find a value for it it is less than the experimental uncertainty incurred in attempts to measure it we now believe that helium 2 the superfluid has zero viscosity although we should be more precise here we believe its viscosity is zero when observing capillary flow bear the statement in mind for we will come up with a contradiction to it in the next experiment where we will look for viscosity by a different method there is a copper cylinder in the liquid helium so mounted that we can turn it about a vertical axis in order to turn it smoothly and with as little vibration as possible we make the cylinder into the armature of a simple induction motor energized from outside the door the four horizontal coils you see provide the torque which turns the cylinder the liquid helium is electrically non-conducting the coils exert no torque on it directly yet as we turn on our motor the liquid layer bounding the cylinder is dragged along by it the boundary layer in turn drags on the next layer and so on outward finally a circulation shows up in the helium due to its own viscosity and the wooden paddle wheel is turned along what we have just seen occurred in helium one the normal phase at 4.2 degrees Kelvin 
That is to say, this demonstration is consistent with our results for helium-1 by capillary flow. Helium-1 is viscous. Here you see the liquid cooled down and passing into the superfluid phase, helium-2. Let's turn on the motor. The paddle wheel starts again. What does this mean? First of all, let me emphasize that, like helium-1, helium-2 is also non-conducting in the electrical sense. In other words, the circulation in the experiment can only have been caused through viscous drag. So we conclude from the rotating cylinder observations that helium-2 is viscous, and from the method of capillary flow that it has zero viscosity. Our experimentation has come up with a paradox. No normal classical liquid is known to behave so inconsistently in capillary flow on the one hand and in bulk flow on the other. This state of affairs forces us to think of helium-2, the superfluid, not as a single, but as a dual liquid. It appears as if helium-2 had two separate and yet interpenetrating component liquids. We shall call one component normal. It is this component which we hold responsible for the appearance of viscosity below the lambda point in the rotating cylinder experiment. The normal component, as the name suggests, behaves like a normal liquid and therefore has viscosity. It is the one which the cylinder drags along as it turns. But the normal component cannot flow through the narrow channels of the ceramic disc because of its viscosity. The second component has zero viscosity and it's called the superfluid component. We think that it does not participate at all in the rotating cylinder experiment below the lambda point. It stays at rest. On the other hand, it can flow through channels of one micron diameter with the greatest of ease, encountering no resistance whatever, because it has no viscosity. As we'll see later, this flow is not impeded even when the capillary diameters are made far smaller than one micron. This thought construction is called the two-fluid model for liquid helium-2. Whether it is correct or not, depends on further tests comparing the theory based on this model with experimental results. We now go on to another phenomenon, the fountain effect. What you see here is a tube which narrows down and then opens into a bulb. A small piece of cotton is stuffed into the constriction between the tube and the bulb. And the bulb has been tightly packed with one of the finest powders available, jeweler's rouge. A second wad of cotton keeps the powder in the bulb. This powder presents extremely fine capillary channels. Their average diameter is a small fraction of one micron. This device has been placed in the doer. The liquid helium is below the lambda point. We submerge the bulb and then we'll send a beam of light from this lamp to a point near the top. You will see the light beam when the lamp is turned on. It focuses some heat in the form of infrared radiation on the point in question. The temperature will rise above the temperature of the rest of the apparatus. Let us turn it on. Liquid helium flows through the hole in the bottom of the bulb, through the fine powder, and rises above the level of liquid helium outside. The height to which it will go depends on the temperature increase produced by the lamp focused on the bulb. We can very well ask, where does the mechanical energy come from that does the work necessary to pump the liquid above the ambient level? Before we attempt to discuss this question, there are two other facts that should be noted. The first is by now obvious. The upward flow through the bulb must clearly be a superflow. Only the superfluid component of helium-2 could get through. The second fact is more significant. 
Let me explain it this way. The superfluid flows spontaneously from A to B, from a cooler to a warmer place. Point A is in the cold liquid, but B is being heated with infrared rays. The second law of thermodynamics positively says that heat cannot of itself flow from a point of lower to a point of higher temperature. What does this mean to us here, knowing as we do that the superfluid is flowing from a colder to a warmer spot? Simply this, it carries no heat, no thermal energy. Any internal energy it may still possess is no longer thermally available. To say it precisely, it has zero entropy. We have discovered another remarkable property of helium-2. Its superfluid component not only is friction-free, it also contains no heat. The heat energy contained in helium-2 as a whole resides, all of it, in the normal component. We may, of course, add heat to the superfluid component, as we are doing when it passes the spot heated by the lamp. But in doing so, we are converting it into the normal component. Let me return briefly to a question posed earlier. Mechanical work is done in pumping the liquid above equilibrium level. Where does it come from? I cannot answer this question here in full. Let it suffice to tell you that we are dealing here with a heat engine. The mechanical energy comes from the heat added at the light spot. An amusing demonstration of the same phenomenon again uses a bulb packed with rouge, but this one opens into a capillary. Light is beamed on a spot just below the capillary, and it produces a helium fountain. The phenomenon in this and the previous experiment has become known as the thermomechanical or the fountain effect. Below the lambda point, the superfluid component of liquid helium creeps up along the walls of its container in an extremely thin film. It is known as the Rollin film. This creeping film is a variety of superflow. It is difficult to make the film itself directly visible to you. To show it indirectly, we've put some liquid helium into a glass vessel. It is below the lambda point. There is no porous bottom in this vessel. The film rises along the inside wall and comes down along the outside, collecting in drops at the bottom. The thickness of this creeping film is only a small fraction of one micron and of the order of two to three hundred angstroms. Its speed, while small just below the lambda point, may reach a value as high as 35 centimeters per second at lower temperatures. Our next experiment deals with the phenomenon of second sound. We are all familiar with wave motion in elastic materials, be they solids, liquids, or gases. Elastic energy of deformation carried away from a source in the form of waves with a characteristic speed, the speed of sound. Liquid helium is an elastic substance, both above and below the lambda point. Both helium 1 and 2 support sound waves. Now, helium 2, the superfluid phase, also conducts heat in the form of waves. This remarkable property is shared by no other substance. For better or for worse, it has been called second sound. Normal heat conduction is a diffusion process. The rate of flow of heat is proportional to the temperature differences. But in helium-2, it is a wave process. Heat flows through helium-2 with a characteristic speed, the speed of second sound. We shall send small heat pulses into helium-2 from a heater. They will spread away from the heater uniformly, carrying the heat energy with them. The speed of second sound is small, just below the lambda point. In the neighborhood of 1.6 degrees Kelvin, it reaches a value of roughly 20 meters per second. And it is in this range that we will run our demonstration. The experimental procedure is as follows. There are two disks in the liquid helium. They are carbon resistors, with the carbon applied in thin layers on one side of each disk. In this way, good thermal contact is established between the resistor and the liquid helium. The bottom resistor will be used 
as a heater. Electric current will be sent through it in pulses from this pulse generator by means of the cable you see here. The output of the generator is also connected via a second cable to a dual trace oscilloscope where it will be 